Is it the one right after us? Terrific. So look at the, the it turns out that the class that is normally coming in here right after us and pushing us out of here on Thursdays is not going to be held today because the professor is sick. And so that what we can do is stay here, not have to lug all the way across there, which is good because uh, I was going to, it's probably going to take a little bit longer than normal for me to get this part of the, of the class done because I want, to, I want to be able to devote next Tuesday and Thursday to our really getting into uh, what, what I propose could actually be done. Uh, constitutionally to address the fundamental problem that we're identifying here pursuant to this thesis. Uh, and so it'll give you a, a much better idea uh, next week as to how it is that I'm anticipating that you'll respond to your uh, challenge in your, in your thesis to provide some sort of a proposal as to what to do about the particular problem that uh, you're identifying, okay? Uh, so anyway, so let's, let's uh, get started with this uh, good news, unfortunately that the professor is sick, but, uh, but that we don't have to walk our way all the way over there. Okay, now <clears throat> what, what we've been doing in the, uh, the beginning of this presentation of, the, of what, what my thesis is as to what's going on in the world, uh, what the major uh, crisis is that is going to be confronting you. In, as you grow into your full adulthood uh, during this century, uh, I've already identified that as this growing climate change and the potential catastrophic consequences and the, the rolling into place of a major national security state <coughs> uh, on the, on here in the United States that would be used to suppress any attempt to really radically intervene to stop this. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. You you get you get a little break. It's just that it won't be it won't be having to lug all the way over there. Yeah, yeah. I'll take three, four deep breaths, and then we'll just get right back into it. Okay. So so anyway, so so I've 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 told you what the what yes, Thomas. I'm sorry for the thesis. You really just want us to select one issue because I know for yours you were kind of talking about it. Well, I'm t I'm talking about in in mine is this this interface between the global climate change uh, and the resistance on the part of the transnational corporate co corporations that are causing it and the resurrection or the construction of this national security state apparatus, which you'll see when we get into next week when we're talking about it, the, the problem that this creates is that if we start to take the moves that are necessary to radically intervene in this ongoing control on the part of the, uh, the corporations, that the apparatus of the national security state is going to be brought to bear identifying us as terrorists or as, as enemies of the state or you know, however they choose to characterize that. So that if you, if you want to set forth a, a couple different uh, things that you think are both going to be happening in this century that are going to combine to cause a, a, a combined crisis, uh, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to just pick one and say just that's the only thing that's going to be happening, okay? Now, as I, as I pointed out to you, uh, I've, I've talked about the fact that, that my thesis is that there is and there has been since the beginning of Western civilization this group, uh, that uh, a small group of people, usually no less than 100 people, that in fact are combining together to actually superimpose their will uh, upon whatever the public governing structures are of the community and that I've begun to describe them and I, I uh, quoted at some length, I hope not too much, uh, from both, from both uh, President Woodrow Wilson uh, and from Franklin Roosevelt, uh, their specific and quite explicit uh, articulation of what the nature of this group was. Uh, and uh, and the, the challenge that they presented uh, to democratic institutions and the type of policies that they were actually pursuing. 
And uh, I had just gotten to the point at the end of uh, the last class on Tuesday uh, talking about the fact that I believe that uh, this group of people are in fact at the present time given the advent of greater communications and, and more rapid transportation, et cetera, they are in fact engaged in the process of attempting to establish what is effectively a one world government. Not, not by having one individual nation state uh, in which the, the transnational corporate capitalists have risen to power to kind of openly dominate the policies of that one nation state and have that nation state uh, go after dominating the whole world as was attempted, and we'll talk about it here today, uh, as was proposed in that first draft of the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance Document that was set forth by Paul Wolfowitz and the others working with Dick Cheney uh, immediately after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. They came forward and, and, and aggressively recommended that this one world domination or full spectrum dominance be undertaken just by our nation state of the United States and to basically subsume under our control all of the other nation states. Uh, this other uh, proposal that is actually going on right now is much more in keeping with the second draft of that, uh, that document. Uh, as you recall, once that first draft got publicly exposed and uh, taken to task by both the New York Times and the Washington Post, that what, what happened is that the, they withdrew that and, the, and uh, George H.W. Bush and Theodore Shackley his director of covert operations for the CIA, uh, they'd redrafted that and came out with the document that is called uh, the projection of US military power into the 21st century and beyond, in which they recommended that this same full spectrum dominance actually be undertaken, but that it not be undertaken in the name of one particular nation state, specifically the United States. They recommended that the same full spectrum dominance be asserted uh, on the part of this new Northern Industrial Alliance and that they identified who the particular members of this new industrial, this Northern Industrial Alliance were uh, and then they listed off all of the Caucasian nations basically. Uh, and, they, and they actually went so far as to state that they were uh, interested in trying to get Russia to join in this new Northern Industrial Alliance now that it had spun off all of its ethnic provinces, that is, all of its non-Caucasian provinces. Uh, and they went to the, the length of actually stating that the objective of this new Northern Industrial Alliance was to maintain the continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials that were needed by members of this new Northern Industrial Alliance. And so that that but what is actually going on, the means by which they're attempting to effectuate that kind of world domination is through the establishment of this world trade organization. Uh, the effort to have the corporations uh, blatantly be able to assert their power. Uh, the banking institutions uh, and, the, and the corporations uh, as private business enterprises being able to actually assert dominion over the lawmaking process of any one or more of the nation states uh, so that they would actually be establishing a, a, a world, a global world order uh, under the auspices of the World Trade Organization whereby they could, could set up regional free trade zones in which all of the countries would be able to engage in free enterprise as it were that is state subsidized corporate enterprise uh, of, of uh, reaping the natural resources from that particular area in both goods and services on the part of human labor and to be able to to do that without any kind of impediments on the part of any of the nation states uh, that were designed to somehow protect the environment in their nation state to protect the safety of the workers in their nation state, to protect uh, the, the, the safety standards in general for consumers 
uh, in their nation states, that none of those type of statutory efforts on the part of the legislative bodies or executive branches from any of the nation states would be allowed to interfere with the free reign that would be given to the corporations to be able to basically expropriate and exploit the resources within that, that nation state. And that would all be done under the auspices of this uh, World Trade Organization uh, to the point where they would end up effectively superseding the nation state system that had been put into place by the Treaty of Westphalia uh, back in 1648 that we talked about. Uh, as, as an additional uh, per aspect of the thesis, I'd pointed out that, that to find who the people are that are in this little group of 60 to 100 men uh, who are behind the scenes kind of manipulating the public uh, governing institutions, that you could find them uh, assembled at various times inside different groups. Uh, and that I pointed out specifically, and we'll talk about it more today, the uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, a, a major financial house, a private investment house uh, that, that existed all through from the late 19th century all through the 20th century as a major dominating force uh, and their law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, that there was this, that the, the private investment uh, clients for Brown Brothers Harriman actually had collectively, uh, for Brown Brothers and Harriman, the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell representing them collectively and the individual members who were private members of this financial house and clients also had uh, Sullivan and Cromwell as their personal attorneys. And so Sullivan and Cromwell became, in a certain sense, the consigliere uh, for this group of organized criminals, basically. Uh, that, uh, and, and as was pointed out by Roosevelt, he said that it's just as damaging for our democracy to fall under the control of a small group of these private corporate uh, owners as it would be to have our country run by organized crime. The fact of the matter is, it is the same. Uh, that in fact, it's, uh, it's just as bad. And that that is what in fact I'm suggesting has happened. Uh, and, and as you recall, Roosevelt said that if the, the rate of consolidation continued at the rate at which it was going back in 1934, he said by the end of this 20th century, i.e. where we are now, uh, that in fact virtually uh, all of the, the business operations and wealth of the country would be owned and controlled by only about a dozen major corporations uh, and that they would be owned by less than 100 men. And we then saw that 1953 uh, statement by uh, James Jesus Angleton, who was retained by Alan Dulles, who was the new director of the Central Intelligence Agency, that James Jesus Angleton was being retained by him to be the counter uh, espionage uh, uh, director for the CIA. And he was, he was allowed to take the position solely on the condition that Angleton would agree never to investigate either Alan Dulles himself or any of the 60 men with whom he had helped finance the rise of Germany uh, prior to World War II and all the way into World War II uh, until they were stopped by a major congressional committee, which we'll talk about today. Uh, so I pointed out that you can find these people in different groups, and we want to do today is we want to move into trying to identify where they are now. Because that we've seen there are different generations of these, of these people. We saw the early generation in, in the United States, at least, of these people with Alexander Hamilton and, and uh, John Adams uh, and, uh, and John Quincy Adams and the, the people that were in the Federalist uh, Party at that time. Uh, we, we saw them arrayed then. And what we've done is we, we were able to, to track some of these people uh, into the later periods uh, into the 19th century. Yes, Thomas. Um, so I was just wondering, because I know you're talking about Woodrow Wilson, and I remember yeah. hearing that he uh, was a KKK uh, sympathizer. I was wondering if there's a connection between uh, these great number of people, the transnational corporations that you're talking about, and the uh, Ku Klux Klan. 
Not really. No, no. The the clan the clan were what what they're analogous to is uh, not even, but th would be to the brown shirts that you saw in in Nazi Germany that were basically organized thugs uh, that were brutal and beating people up and stuff like this. That uh, I, I've had some dealings with the Ku Klux Klan and have done a number of depositions regarding them, et cetera. And we were involved uh, in, in meeting with uh, Maurice, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, what's his name, Mor Morris Dees, uh, actually prior to their setting up the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center is the major group, major watchdog monitoring the Klan and these other right-wing crypto-fascist groups in the country, uh, the, the more general ones. And, uh, and there's, we've never been able to ascertain any kind of more direct coordination over the Klan uh, by people at higher levels. That uh, we have found governors involved with them, we have found individuals involved with them. The, the fact is that, uh, that uh, Justice Black was a supporter of the Klan uh, before he was made a Supreme Court Justice. And he did a complete 180 and, and basically ended up opposing them, etc. But uh, people who have come out of the South in their earlier years who may have been involved with the Klan uh, before they rose into kind of a, a highly educated level uh, is, not, is not what we're talking about here. That uh, what, what we're saying is, is that these people in, this, in these higher realms, let, let's call it the 60 to 100 men that we're talking about. And uh, there's only one woman that I've come across that uh, appears to have been involved uh, at, at that high level. Uh, again, probably because they're misogynist as well as racist. Uh, but there's, there's one person, uh, Christine Walton, uh, of uh, Walmart uh, appears to be potentially at that type of a level now, but we'll discuss this later. But uh, as I say, that it's important to remember that these people, uh, th there was this whole period of time that we'll talk about again later today, there was this whole period of time uh, between World War I and World War II when the, when the fascists were on the rise in Germany being funded by the Union Bank of New York uh, and through the, the Bank of uh, Commerce and Shipping in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, when in fact there was open sympathy being demonstrated toward the fascists uh, by Henry Luce uh, and by uh, John D. Rockefeller, by Henry Ford, uh, by a number of these people that we're going to be talking about, that, it, that in fact were openly sympathetic toward fascism and suggesting that fascism was the way of the future, that this, this actual self-conscious wedding, in a sense, between the state and the corporations uh, was a, a perfectly good way to go, and that it was efficient and, and successful, uh, and, uh, and could uh, avoid some of the, the, the problems that you might encounter in private business, like losing money. Uh, and, and so the, 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 this, this not only sympathy f toward fascism, but in fact, an active and conscious embrace of fascism itself, even to the point of being the one that were instigating fascism and financing the rise of fascism in Europe uh, is, uh, is what really characterized the consciousness of these, of these people. And, uh, so what I, what I was doing, I was just going through at the end of class last time, some of the qualities and characteristics uh, of these people. And we've gotten to the point of pointing out that it's an important thing to remember for all of those of you who are thinking uh, about going to law school, uh, which I hope may be even a few more of you after taking this course, uh, is that, that their lawyers, their lawyers functioned as the consiglieri for this group of people. Their lawyers were the field men, the operations people, who not only would represent them in court uh, against antitrust actions and stuff like that on the part of the Roosevelt administration, uh, but they would also represent them in negotiations. Uh, they would represent them with regard to foreign countries. Uh, they, would, they would, in fact, sit in council with them uh, and help them plan and plot. Uh, they would explain to them how they could go about doing what it is they wanted to get away with uh, by skirting the law and regulations. And they would represent them in front of Congress by going to Congress and lobbying and drafting legislation uh, and carrying bags of money to give them to the senators and to the congressmen to bribe them 
uh, into accepting their positions. Their lawyers have always been the front men uh, for these people. These people operate from the shadows, as I've said before, uh, but their lawyers are out there, out there doing their deeds for them. Uh, and that's why uh, groups like Sullivan and Cromwell and others are so protective of not wanting people to know what their client list looks like. Uh, because you can begin to figure out uh, who, who their principles are. Uh, but, but that's an, another important factor. In, the, in some of these people, uh, back in the, in, the, uh, in the 19th century, uh, this period between the end of the Civil War in 1868 up until 1898, that, that mere 30 year period that we're talking about here, uh, some of these people that rose to power uh, during that time uh, have become quite prominent. People like John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and Cornelius Vanderbilt and Andrew Carnegie and E.H. Harriman, the big railroad baron, and Jay Gould and some others. Uh, but there's, there's a, a long list of these people, uh, but it's not that extensive. Uh, that, you, that, that you can very easily find for the 19th century people that were in this group you can find them listed in a dozen different places. Uh, uh, in that they, they include John Jacob Astor uh, and others that you don't know quite as well. Marshall Field, the ones that owned the big set of department stores, the early ones on. Uh, and uh, John Wayne Gates, after whom John Wayne took his name, actually. Uh, that, that, that wasn't his real name, John Wayne. Uh, and uh, you got, you got uh, lots of these people. Andrew Mellon. Mellon, the big Mellon family. Uh, Richard Mellon Scaife, one of his grandsons, was one of the secret financiers of the off-the-shelf enterprise with, uh, with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. Uh, Richard Mellon Scaife uh, is one of the guys that helped fund setting up the Washington Standard, uh, which is where Bill Crystal and the rest of those fascists kind of hang out. Uh, that, that uh, of course, you know John D. Rockefeller, Charles Schwab, that, that you see on the television commercials that were a big in, uh, group investment uh, group together. Uh, also the DuPonts, uh, the Irene DuPont was one of the, the major people involved in this. I mean, in, the, in these people back, we're, we're talking about now back in the 1880s and 1890s that John D. Rockefeller that, that owned Standard Oil of New Jersey and Standard Oil of California, et cetera, he was at that time worth $336 billion, you know, back at that time. That, yes, yeah, $336 billion. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, you could buy the country, basically. Well, he did, uh, actually. Uh, and and the, what, what I want to point out here is that this group of people, uh, this group of people back at that time, that you saw that, that Roosevelt actually said in his book, that these people have really felt completely authorized to take control of the government and have the government function basically as an appendage of their business interests. And that's exactly what it is that happened. And in fact, uh, they spent that time working from the 1880s uh, on up into 19, early 1900, 1906. They spent their time actually getting the United States government to, to mount in field foreign military expeditionary forces of U.S. military, mainly the Marine Corps, uh, to send them in to, to places in Latin America to take control of the country and overthrow their government uh, and set up you know, sugar plantations for United Fruit and banana, banana plantations, etc. In fact, in fact, you can find that they're from 1890 uh, up to 1910, uh, there were a dozen, uh, 1890, they sent troops to, to uh, Argentina. Uh, in 1891, they sent uh, Marine Corps uh, into uh, Chile. In 1891, they sent troops into Haiti. In 1894, they sent troops into Nicaragua. Uh, in 1895, they sent Marine Corps uh, into Panama. In 1896, they sent uh, United States Marines uh, at the Port of Carino in Nicaragua. In 1898, of course, the famous sending them into Cuba and, uh, and overthrowing Cuba. Uh, 1898 was Puerto Rico. 
1899, Nicaragua. Uh, 1903, Honduras. 1904, the Dominican Republic. Uh, 1906, uh, back uh, uh, into Cuba, more, to, to, uh, to stop a democratic election in that instance. In 1907, into, uh, into Nicaragua again. And it goes on and on. Uh, and, and very importantly, as I, as I pointed out, that at the end of World War I, uh, in 1914, 1915, 16, as the, and the war was end, winding down, in 1917, when the Bolsheviks overthrew the Tsar in Russia uh, and took over the government, the, the Secretary of, uh, of, of State at that time, Robert Lansing, under Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson had had a stroke, a very major stroke, and he was more or less incapacitated. And what happened is Robert Lansing actually participated in instigating, sending a foreign military expeditionary force into Russia to actually try to crush the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, you know, and so what, what's going on there? I mean, we had just gotten through uh, having a war uh, in in uh, in Europe with Germany. And now the United States is sending military troops into Russia to try to crush the Russian Revolution. Okay, and so that and so you, you take a look at this guy Robert Lansing, and you and you start to discover say this Robert Lansing, and I've touched upon it briefly, but I want to emphasize it here. Robert Lansing, who was the Secretary of State for Woodrow Wilson, was in fact the son-in-law of John W. Foster. And John W. Foster had been the Secretary of State back in 1893, when, they, when a lot of these things were going on, and, uh, and uh, building all the way up to 1898, when they ended up taking over Cuba. And so, so John W. Foster was uh, a, a guy that was unbridled in his imperialist ambitions. Uh, he, was, he was blatant about his belief in manifest destiny, his belief in the white man's burden, uh, his belief that the United States had a, a destiny uh, to expand and control all of the North American and South American continent. Uh, you know, just unbridled about that. Uh, and, and the fact is, is that he is the grandfather of Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. Uh, that one of his other daughters, the one that didn't marry Robert Lansing, married Alan Dulles's and John Foster Dulles's father, uh, who, who was a, a minister, actually, a fairly minor character. Uh, and, uh, but his wife was the daughter of John W. Foster. And so what John W. Foster did is John W. Foster retired and actually spent his time training John, uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles to rise into positions of power in the United States and to have his son-in-law, Robert Lansing, become the, the Secretary of State so they could continue from, from the shadows to continue to control policy. And that's what they did. Okay, and so that Robert Lansing, uh, as the Secretary of State for, uh, for Woodrow Wilson at the end of World War I, when they set up the Versailles Treaty, negotiations actually invited his young nephews, the grandchildren of John W. Foster, as young lawyers to come and participate in the Versailles Treaty and actually participate in drafting into the Versailles Treaty the reparations requirements that Germany have imposed upon it for uh, having initiated an aggressive war in World War I in that they were required under the Treaty of Versailles to pay reparations to the private companies whose property they had damaged during the war. And it turned out that many of those big co corporations were clients of Brown Brothers Harriman. And the fact is, Alan Dulles was the attorney for Brown Brothers Harriman. And he, in fact, was assigned to the Versailles Treaty to actually put in the reparations demands so that Germany would have to repay their clients for the damage they'd inflicted. And because of his uncle being the Secretary of State, he was, in fact, in a position to get appointed to be the lawyer for Germany as well. So he was actually representing Germany and representing the people that they owed the money to and representing the people that were going to give loans to Germany 
to repay their other clients. I mean, the, the, the extraordinary degree of consolidation of power uh, from the shadows. Uh, the, in, but all of this is kind of taking place right in front of everybody, but nobody can understand what's happening because they think it's the United States policy. But in fact, it's being manipulated from behind the scenes by, by John W. Foster and by John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. And then Alan Dulles ends up getting appointed to be the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay? Now, that what, what, what I'm saying is that you, you need to understand that, th that these guys are lawyers. These guys are lawyers in that they're, they're, being, they're moving from place to place, representing different interests at different times, but they're coordinating a policy from the shadows uh, to, to effectuate the objectives of this small group of people. Uh, you know, that are, that are 60 to 100 people that own the majority of the stock in some dozen or so major corporations. And so that when Roosevelt came in, Roosevelt tried to break this up. He tried to, in, he tried to impose antitrust laws that says you can't, you can't own, you know, virtually all of the different competing businesses in one entire field of business. Because that puts you in a situation where what you do is you drive everybody else out of business because you have the ability to, to take losses in a given area of the country and drive all of your competitors out of business by selling the, the product below what, what it even costs you to make it and you make your profits in other areas and then once you've driven those people out of business, your competitors, you move back in and now that you have monopoly control over the product, you increase the price of the product way above what its natural value would be. So that the capacity to establish those type of monopolies over various resources like the oil uh, production, the steel production, uh, the, the cotton production, the transportation, the railways, uh, etc., the shipping lines, these are the things that these people owned. These people, because of the creation of the corporation as a new mode of doing business, they were able to get all of those operations incorporated and then they would move in and buy out the stock of those other, of those other corporations. Uh, they would lure smaller businesses into to making themselves a corporation because they were tempted by the immunization that it gave them to, against liability. And then once they did that, they had to share as a condition for being given that kind of special privilege by the state, they had to be willing to share, they had to be willing to offer shares to the public. And these other guys, these tycoons, would come swooping in like vultures and buy up those shares until they got control of those corporations. And then they would sit on each other's boards. They would sit on each other's boards of directors. They had what they called interlocking directorates so that they would actually come together, the, these 50, 60 men, they would come together and they owned the controlling interest in virtually all of the companies that handled all the steel production, all the iron works, uh, all of the railroads, all the shipping lines, all the petroleum, uh, and, and the, the shipping of cotton in agricultural products. Uh, and the, and the, it was going on right in front of everybody. And the, the, in fact, history has designated this as the era of the robber barons. You know, and, and so that it isn't, it isn't uh, that this isn't known in history. It's just that people don't like to talk about what the full implications of it are. And they love to talk about it as having been in the past. That somehow it's all over now. Like Hal, I feel much better now, Dave. You know, Dave, Dave, I feel much better now. I'm, I'll be fine. Uh, just let me, let me stay in control and I'll behave myself. You know, which they don't. Because when, when Roosevelt came in uh, and started uh, attempting to insert uh, into the laws uh, antitrust provisions that would break up these huge monopolies, forbidding these kind of interlocking directorates, etc., that what, what happened is they decided they were going to mount a coup against him. Uh, and, and, uh, it, and it's funny because everybody with a political IQ above room temperature knows that it happened. And yet, 
because the New York Times came out and Time Magazine, owned by Henry Luce, who himself was a rock-ribbed fascist, uh, and, and put, the, put Mussolini and Hitler and, and Franco on the front covers, I've mentioned to you, of Time Magazine and Fortune and Life Magazine no less than six times. Uh, you know, between 1924 and 1934, praising uh, their great work in Europe. Uh, you know, because they ended up saying that they didn't believe the, the accusations that this coup had been attempted, uh, that they tried to pretend that they could just manufacture reality and that people wouldn't know about it. But, but, that, but that is, in fact, what happened. And in fact, there's, uh, that uh, we told you, I mean, it would be better if, if uh, General Butler's name probably wasn't Schmedley, uh, but Schmedley Butler uh, is, the, is the Marine Corps Commandant at the time that was approached by these people to ask him to, to uh, lead a major uh, military coup against the Roosevelt administration. In fact, he went on and he, he testified. He testified in front of uh, Congress uh, in, in front of the, uh, the committee, it's called the Dickstein, the Dickstein Committee, uh, and, and the, Dix, the McCormick Dickstein Committee uh, actually stated uh, after, after the investigation uh, in, 1930, in 1934, it convened on November 20th of 1934, uh, and they started taking testimony and, and, and conducting an investigation about this. It was one of the great initial investigations, like the Watergate investigations and hearings, the Iran-Contra investigations, you know, et cetera, the Church Committee investigation. This was one of the really early major investigations, along with the one that was investigating the Teapot Dome scandal. That this one in 1934, the, the McCormick Dickstein Committee, they said, here was their final report. This committee has received direct evidence that certain persons were engaged in an attempt to establish a fascist regime in this country. There is no evidence, however, showing any direct connection between this effort and any of the specific fascist countries in Europe. There is no question, however, that such attempts were in fact being discussed, were being planned, and were planning to be put into place uh, when and if the financial backers of this group deemed it to be expedient. It says, uh, uh, Gerald McGuire, uh, who was the, the chief of staff for J.P. Morgan, of J.P. Morgan Guarantee Trust, J.P. Morgan, that uh, his chief of staff, uh, Gerald McGuire, uh, had met repeatedly with General Butler, uh, starting to plan this being done. And, he, and, and so they, they go on to say, Gerald McGuire has appeared before this committee and has denied these allegations under oath. However, this committee has been able to verify all of the pertinent accusations that were made by General Butler. This effort was indeed corroborated. Uh, the, this effort was indeed corroborated in the correspondence of McGuire with his principal, one Mr. Robert Sterling Clark. There's one. That's the guy that was the major heir to the Singer Sewing Machine Company. That probably, you guys probably don't know what a Singer Sewing Machine is, but it was it was the old it was the old uh, sewing machines uh, where they had the little pedal on them and it would spin this little wheel and it was actually a sewing machine which they had in a lot of the major uh, factories, textile factories, etc. And they made millions. My mom's got one of those. There you go. So and see, so Ro Robert Sterling Clark. Was the was the prince was the principal heir to that fortune? He was one of the guys, along with J. P. Morgan, and along along with uh, with uh, Irani Dupont, and the four or five other guys. They were all involved in this. And he said, uh, in, in, uh, and they also said that separately, Veterans Affair, Veterans of Foreign Affairs Commander General James E. Van Zant, has stated to the New York Times that. Less than two months after I was warned of this plot by General Butler, I myself was approached by agents of Wall Street and was asked to lead a fascist dictatorship here in the United States under the guise of establishing a veterans organization. And that was a quote in the New York Times on November 11th of 1934 on page three. Okay, so, so the fact is this did happen. Not a single person was prosecuted. Uh, nothing was done to, to punish them for this. 
uh, they just thought that now that they were caught, it was kind of embarrassing and that they would uh, just step back a little bit. Uh, and, and for those of you, I've, I'd recommended that you, you guys here during the month of May uh, get a copy of on the internet and look at Seven Days in May. Uh, seven Days in May, uh, I'm getting a little out of time sequence-wise, uh, but this was a, a specific request on the part of John Kennedy that this movie be made. And in the movie, uh, there is a, 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 an attempt to establish a military coup against the president who has decided he's going to engage in negotiations with the Soviet Union to dismantle the nuclear weapons of both sides. We'll get to this later today. Uh, but that, in fact, is what, what John Kennedy was doing at the time. <clears throat> and, and what happened is that, uh, that one, one of the authors uh, of the, the book called Seven Days in May, a journalist, I mentioned this, I think, the other day, interviewed Curtis LeMay, who was the chief of staff for the United States Air Force in 1962. And, and General Curtis LeMay just excoriated Kennedy and, and, and told, told the, uh, the reporter that, uh, that Kennedy was, a, was a, spineless, a spineless little coward, you know, whose father had bought him his position in the Senate and bought him the presidency, uh, and, that, and that he was a, a womanizer and a philanderer, and, and basically the Joint Chiefs of Staff hated him. And he told him that. And so the, the guy went out and wrote this book called Seven Days in May, in which it sets forth this whole plot on the part of the military to overthrow the president. Uh, and it gets to the very end, and when the, the plot is, is finally proven to the president at that time in the story, the president covers it up doesn't want the people to know that something like that happened. Because, in the words of Gary Sick, who was a, uh, a National Security Council uh, representative to President Jimmy Carter, uh, when, when he said in his book called The October Surprise, he said that those of us who have lived in Washington, D.C. for 20 years or more have become accustomed to the periodic scandal when a given congressman or senator will be discovered to be a womanizer uh, or an alcoholic uh, or who has been uh, foolish enough to get their hand caught in the till taking money from their own private campaigns uh, for their personal use. He said, and that in those instances, all of the news media and their colleagues rush in and excoriate this person uh, uh, thereby attempting to demonstrate to the American people that the system works. He said, but on the other hand, there is another category of crime that is committed periodically. Uh, and this is, this is the type of crime that if, the, if revealed to the American public would undermine the confidence of the governed in their governors. And these will not be revealed to the American people. And that's why if, if we hadn't been able to uncover the, the, uh, the recordings in the White House Oval Office of Richard Nixon, that Richard Nixon probably would have gotten away with orga organizing the burglary of the Democratic headquarters and setting up a plumber's unit inside the White House to burglarize offices, et cetera. Sam. Uh, I don't know if you watched South Park, but they, they have an episode where the, the boys try and uncover the truth surrounding the 9-11. Oh, really? uh, it's really poignant and very well done. Uh, yeah, they, they basically go through like nine different levels of conspiracy to where people are writing these blog posts. So, oh, I know who really did it and all that. And in the end, they, they show up at the White House and the U.S. government has started conspiracies to cover up the fact that they have no idea why it happened or who did it. Uh, so it's this sort of like, you know, the government's incompetence. They're trying to cover up their own incompetence by planting seeds that there were, you know, all that. Well, that, that's, see, that, that's a very sophisticated cover-up uh, on their part, right. you know, of, uh, of the, 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 the program's part, of suggesting that it's basically just the incompetence of these people that keeps them from ever knowing. They used to say that about the Iran-Contra thing. Oh, this is just so complicated, you know, all these foreign names. You know, like they can't remember the names of the people. And so therefore, it was too complicated to really follow. Everybody knew what had happened. You know, everybody knew who was behind it and what they were doing. They'd been caught with their pants down. Uh, and nobody wanted to admit it. 
because the, both the Republican and Democratic Party wanted this kind of thing to go on because they used them in the shadows. Okay, and so 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 what I'm saying here is that that uh, these qualities uh, of this group of people uh, are very important because what happened in 1934, this attempted coup, the continued funding behind the scenes uh, by, the, by the, the clients of Brown Brothers Harriman and the legal clients of uh, Sullivan and Cromwell, you know, under the leadership, I might add, uh, of George Herbert Walker, who was in fact the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman who is the grandfather of George H.W. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. That's his grandfather. That he was the one that was the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman. He's the one that got them all to pool money and set up the Union Bank of New York. He's the one that set up the, the branch office in the Netherlands of the, the Bank of Commerce and Shipping uh, under, under Fritz Thyssen. They're the ones that were lending the money to the National Socialist Movement in Germany that became the fascist movement. Okay, and so this isn't rocket science, you know, and, and the fact of the matter is they got caught doing it and that they had another, another set of hearings. These were all closed door hearings that took place in 1941 and 42, in which they caught George Herbert Walker and Prescott Bush, his son-in-law, <coughs> you know, uh, that they were financing the major uh, ball bearing factories. They, they were giving the secret formulas to artificial rubber uh, to the to the to the Germans, uh, they were giving them the formulas for uh, artificial petroleum that they could make. Uh, you know, they were doing uh, the lubricants and stuff. They were giving all this information to Germany. They were selling it to them, uh, and they got caught. And so that they they in fact didn't do anything to them. They just told them to stop doing it. And the and the in order to protect them having anything bad done to them, Prescott Bush hired a lawyer to represent him which was Alan Dulles. He hired Alan Dulles, you know, to be his lawyer. Uh, and here's Dulles again, uh, you know, once again showing up like that. And so that what, what I'm saying is, is that if you, if you can follow the names, if you can remember the names of the people and recognize every time you see them and start putting the dots up on a graph, you can tell where these people are and when they come together, and where they're meeting. Uh, and, uh, and, and what these what these people did is they, so we have the meeting again on January 4th of 1933. We have the meeting that took place uh, at the home, uh, at the home of the, uh, the major banker uh, in Germany uh, at the time. Uh, what's his name, Von, uh, what was his name here? <coughs> Anyway, on Jan January 4th of, of 1933, uh, they, they, had the, they had the meeting uh, with Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, meeting in the home of Baron, uh, Baron von Schroeder, one of the major bankers. Uh, he was the head of the Tool, the Tool Society in Germany and one of the major bankers. He was partners with uh, Fritz Thyssen, who was the head of the bank in the Netherlands, the Bank of, of, Commer of Shipping and, and Commerce, which was a branch office of the Union Bank of New York. That this guy, so he's, they're sitting in the meeting in the Cologne home of Baron von Schroeder with Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles meeting directly with Adolf Hitler in order to get Hitler to agree that he will agree to pay the loans off that have been given to them by the clients of Brown Brothers Harriman, Alan Dulles being the lawyer for them, that if, if Hitler will agree to pay off the new loans that have been given to them to pay off the damages that have been inflicted by Germany in World War I to the other clients of Brown Brothers Harriman, that they will agree for him to become the Chancellor of Germany. And they will agree to allow him to come into power and establish a fascist government uh, in Germany. Okay, and it turns out that this uh, that this uh, this fellow uh, this fellow Baron von Schroeder uh, was in fact the the head of another group called the Heron Club. H e r r e n k l u b. The Heron Club in Germany, one of the major private uh, elite uh, men's clubs 
uh, in Germany, like I was telling you about before, like the kind in New York. And it turns out that, the, uh, that he was uh, partners with uh, this, the co-director of the Thyssen foundry, the, the uh, steel foundry uh, in Germany. Uh, he was a partner with a guy named Johann Groger, G-R-O-E-N-G-E-R, -E -E Groenger. And it turns out this guy was the business partner of Prescott Bush <laughs> uh, in, the, in the Union Bank of New York. Uh, and he was also, the, th this guy Groenger was the vice president of the Hamburg America shipping lines that was uh, the other partner of which was Prescott Bush. Again, so you got Prescott Bush and George Herbert Walker and uh, Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. They're, they're all involved through Baron von Schroeder sitting down in this meeting on, on February, on January 4th of 1933, authorizing Adolf Hitler to become the Chancellor of Germany and to set up a fascist state. Okay, so that the, that, uh, I guess I don't have to keep on piling it on here. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that you understand that, that when, when the Germans, the German fascists rose to power in Germany, and you know that whole sad story, the bottom line is that the United States government never would agree or be allowed to go to war against them. That they were, they were, they'd invaded Poland in 1939. They'd invaded Paris uh, in France. They were marching down the Champs Elysees. They set up the Vichy government in France. They were firebombing England, and the United States was not doing anything to stop them, because this group of powerful business people in the United States were blocking any ability of the United States to go to war to defend our traditional allies in Europe against this. Oh, there, 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 were, there was a whole bunch of that. Stuff. No, there, there were a whole bunch of these things where, where there were there were steps taken by John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, both partners in the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. They were representing corporations to actually refuse to give patents and stuff to allow any United States manufacturers to build out any type of major war preparations. That they they were not only opposing it politically. But they were opposing it industrially, okay. And so that so that what they did is when when the what what Roosevelt did is Roosevelt started setting up a process by means of which he started instigating Japan to come and attack us. That's what he was doing because the because the Germany had established an Axis power with with uh, Germany in Italy and Japan. Uh, in Spain, they, they'd established a fascist uh, axis. Uh, and so what, what Roosevelt did is Roosevelt started taking actions against Japan, cutting off any, uh, the, the sale of any kind of scrap metal to them, cutting off the supplies to them, doing all kinds of things that he could, and in fact, continuing to press out into the Pacific, uh, building more bases in Hawaii and in Guam and in the Philippines, etc trying to lure the Japanese into attacking them. And what he finally did, the way he finally got it done, is he put virtually all of the major destroyers in the Sixth Fleet into, har into the harbor, in, in uh, Pearl Harbor, and then brought in all th three of the major United States aircraft carriers and brought them into harbor, in, in Pearl Harbor. It was just absolutely too tempting a target to resist. And so the Japanese mounted an attack to, uh, to attack the, the, uh, the uh, Pearl Harbor. And so what happened is the, the day and a half before they all arrived, and the, 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 the fleet was already on its way to attack them, that the, by, by cover of night, Roosevelt had the three aircraft carriers leave the harbors and, and go out to sea so they wouldn't be hit. And, uh, and sacrificed all of those people to allow the, the Japanese to attack us uh, so that the American people would rise up and overwhelm this fascist element uh, in the business community and insist upon us going to war against Japan. 
And the fact of the matter is we never did declare war against Germany. Germany declared war against us because we declared war against Japan for their having attacked us. And that's how Roosevelt got us in. This. Yes, Sophia. Where is the historical evidence for this? And are there actually pieces of paper that say this? There's tons of it. There's tons really? of it. Oh, yes. Yeah. You, all you, have to do, you can do a paper on it. You know, uh, yes, you yes, yeah, you can. The, because the, the, I thought the, you the, said I can't. I, yeah. I, I thought you said that. You could, you, could, uh, you could work one up. I could talk to you later on it. Okay. But the, the, the bottom line is that there are, there are three major books about it, historical books about it now. And once they've revealed that the United States knew, uh, had broken the codes for Japan. They'd broken all the codes for Japan. So they were listening to all of their traffic. You know, of the entire fleet when it was coming in, in, in organizing itself to, to get the airplanes uh, aloft and everything. The United States knew all about what they were doing. Uh, and they, they, just, they just allowed this to happen. Not only allowed it to happen, but they facilitated it happening. They goaded them into doing this. Uh, and, and, and it turns out that it's, it's probably true that it would have been impossible for Roosevelt to mobilize the Congress under the domination that it was under these people. Uh, to get them to go to war against Germany, to stop them from simply, in, in fact, in fact, uh, Henry Luce, the owner and publisher of Time Magazine and Life Magazine, published an article uh, in 1941 uh, that was called The American Century, in which he openly advocated that the United States not become involved in the war against Germany. That the best thing for the United States would be to allow Germany to win and to establish a fascist regime throughout Europe because then we would be able to do business with them. Uh, and so that, that, that uh, the American century uh, is where the term comes from now that we'll get to later today uh, called the project for a new American century. The project for a new American century is the private group that was organized by Dick Cheney and, uh, and Paul Wolfowitz and the others who were the draftsmen of the first draft of the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance Document that had advocated the establishment of full spectrum dominance on the part of the United States. Uh, these are the guys. Uh, in that they, when, they, when they didn't prevail and George H.W. Bush drafted the second uh, iteration of that uh, with Theodore Shackley, when, when George H.W. Bush lost, the election in 1992, they all falsely blamed it on the fact that he had said no more taxes, no new taxes, and he backed out of his position, and that's why he lost. Total crap, you know, but they just pushed it out there, uh, and that he was too soft, and so that they backed up and set up the project for New American Century, and worked their way right in, picked out, picked out W. Bush to be the candidate, mainly because they couldn't get Jeb, because Jeb had been caught, you know, meeting with drug smugglers. Uh, we'll deal with that when he gets ready to run. Uh, but, but anyway, yes. You mentioned Dulles was a part of, he helped draft the reparations. Yes, yes, in the Versailles Treaty. It's kind of ironic that, because I, 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 I got that uh, the Sultan Cromwell book. Oh yeah, yo, the, the uh, law unto themselves. And when, he, yeah, and when, when he said that, I thought it was ironic because it said that he was a avid supporter of Germany's aggress aggression based on why wouldn't they Payments yes. Laid upon them. Oh yeah, yeah. No, absolutely <laughs> That's right. Ironic. That's right. No, more than ironic. Okay. So, so the, so the bottom line that gets us all the way into World War II. All right. And so when we we start coming to the end of World War II, this this is a critical place. This is where where I was first stunned when I really ran into this thing because I didn't know about it at all. And all all the time I spent in undergraduate school and law school and everything, no one had ever told me about this. But what I, what I discovered is, is that, that in the final, the final months of World War II, that uh, Reinhard Galen, who was the Major General Reinhard Galen, who was the, uh, the commander of anti-Soviet and anti-Eastern Bloc intelligence for the Third Reich, he realized uh, in, in, uh, in, in mid-1944 uh, that the war was lost. Well, he realized it in February, February of 1943, as I've mentioned, when the, when the Fifth Army of Germany uh, was defeated in front of the gates of Stalingrad. They froze to death in the winter, that winter. 
uh, and on, on February 3rd of uh, 1943, uh, they surrendered to the Russian, the Russian army. And uh, the, the, it broke the back of the German military. Uh, and the United States had already destroyed the Japanese fleet at Midway in June of 1944. So that both of the major powers were broken and that it was only going to be a matter of time before the, the war was won by the Allies. And so what, what uh, Reinhard Galen did is Reinhard Galen uh, uh, photo, photocopied, not, he didn't have photocopiers then, but he, he microfilmed uh, all of the documentation that he had inside the Third Reich's intelligence office, the anti-Soviet and anti-Eastern Bloc intelligence office. He, he photographed and put on, on microfilm all of the documents with all the names of all their contacts, their undercover people, their, their spies and everything throughout the, throughout the, the world, uh, and including deep into Russia. Uh, and he put them in seven barrels uh, of uh, big watertight barrels, and he and seven other guys uh, left Germany and they went up into Bavaria, up into the mountains by Oberammergau, uh, and they buried these barrels in a big meadow uh, and stayed in this little cabin waiting for the end of the war. And when the end of the war came, Reinhard Galen, dressed in the uniform of a private, uh, an American private, you know, walked all the way down from there and, and went into the headquarters of the 101st Counterintelligence Corps and turned himself in and said, uh, I am Major General Reinhard Galen, the head of the, uh, the Third Reich's anti-Soviet and anti-Eastern Bloc intelligence. This, we know this, the war is over now, and your major adversary is going to be the Soviet Union. So you need me. You need me and my organization. We know who all these people are. You know, we were trying to tell you that these are the major foe. You should have joined with us in this major war to, uh, against Bolshevism. You know, we, we were the bulwark against Bolshevism in Europe, you know, and, uh, and uh, you guys wouldn't come on board with us. Uh, and, uh, and so the bottom line is he ended up negotiating. He was assigned uh, two translators from the 101st Counterintelligence Corps, uh, one of whom was Theodore G. Shackley. Theodore G. Shackley was a young uh, German-born uh, naturalized American citizen who had come over to the United States with his family uh, when he was a, a young teenager. Uh, and at the beginning of World War I, or excuse me, World War II, in, in December of 1941, he had enlisted. And because of his fluency in German and Polish and English, he became a translator, a German-American translator. He was assigned to, uh, to be the translator for Reinhard Galen. And so Reinhard Galen began to carry on these set of negotiations with the the OSS, the Office of Special Services, and the military intelligence of the United States was brought to the United States and spent two weeks, almost three weeks, negotiating at Fort Hunt outside of Washington, D.C., negotiating to have the United States make Galen the head of intelligence for the new West German government that was going to be set up by the United States in West, the western half of Germany. Uh, and he would agree if they would take a uh, hundred of his men off the Nuremberg war crimes tribunal lists, that he would take these men and himself and they would set up and become the office of intelligence for West Germany. And they would function as the source of intelligence against the Soviet Union, which they did for 26 years. They, spent, they were the chief source. Fascist Nazis, literally, were the ones that were the chief source of intelligence against the Soviet Union. And so that they were lying to the United States, saying that the Soviet Union was preparing to invade Europe. And, and they knew perfectly well that, in fact, I mean, Russia had lost 20 million people. 20 million people were killed in Russia during World War II. And they, they were, their whole economy was in ruins. And the, the, and the fact is, is that they were literally tearing up the rail lines that went into Europe from Russia, tearing up the metal air, uh, rail lines to, m to be able to build things in Russia. Uh, in, in, the, in the Galen's office, the Galen organization was lying to the Western powers, saying that the Russians were planning to invade Europe. It's completely ridiculous. You know, they're not going to tear up their main lines of supply uh, into Europe if they're planning to invade them. But they were lying to them. 
because what they they planned to do is they they wanted to they wanted to bring in the United States into basically joining with them to continue their war to continue their war to establish fascism as the primary mode of governance and economic development uh, in Western civilization. That's what they wanted to do. And so what, what they did is uh, Galen, right away, uh, one of the things that he did is he set up a special intelligence school. Uh, he set up the Anti-Communist Special Warfare Training Academy in, uh, in, uh, up in the mountains of Bavaria. Uh, at a place called Oberammergau. Uh, it was near one of the castles that during, during the rise of Hitler into power to 1934 and 1937, that, that uh, they had, uh, Hitler had established a, a system of schools uh, in Germany that were called the Ordensbergen, uh, the Order of the Castles, it's called. And they set up these four, uh, these four castles with these like, you know, 45 foot high uh, Teutonic Knights on these uh, on these uh, big equestrian these big equestrian statues, you know, with the Viking horns and the whole nine yards. And and what they would do is they they would take they would take a thousand young German men between the ages of 18 and 26, and they would bring a thousand of these young men to the first one of these academies that was at Krosensee. Crozensee is uh, one of the castles that they spent 20 million dollars building this castle. And they brought them there and of the thousand, the thousand men would all compete with each other physically. They would have, they would have boxing matches, wrestling matches, uh, foot races, uh, mountain climbing tests, swimming, long distance swimming, long distance running, uh, uh, archery, uh, uh, marksmanship, uh, every every physical type of uh, competition they could think of, and they would spend a full year at that at that first castle, and then at the end of the year uh, they would take the top 100 out of those thousand, and the other 900 would become SS. This was the SS training system that they had in place in Germany, and so that the other 900 people would become SS. Uh, troops. The hundred of them would then go on to the second castle at Vogelsang. At Vogelsang, they spent 150 million dollars building this next bigger castle for these guys. And the hundred of them would go there and they would spend a full year studying the entire ideology of fascism. The economics of fascism, the racial theories of the of the Third Reich about the the inferiority of the Jews, uh, how the Jews were in fact the biological land bridge uh, between the Caucasians and the the uh, uh, what, what they call them? they called them the the uh, uh, no I can't remember there's there's a word that they they had a German word for the people but, but they they were basically all of the other people all of the underling people. Uh, the people of color, which they were nomadic peoples of the world, and that they viewed the Jews, who were nomadic, without a without a land base, that these were people that would interbreed, both with the colored people of the world, but also with the Caucasians, and so they were the threat. They were the threat. They were the biological land bridge. They called them between the the people of color and the Caucasian Ubermensch. And so that they would teach all this ideology at this second academy of the Vogelsang, and then they would take the top uh, 10 students out of that 100, and then the other 90 of them would become SS officers. And the 10 of them would go on to the third school at, uh, at uh, Southoff, Southoffen, S-O-U-T-H-O-F-E-N, Southoffen. That uh, it was a, the third castle in the order of the castles, and these ten guys would go there, and they would start training them to become deputy führers. That they were training them to be deputy führers, and they would take they would take the top student, and move that student on to the fourth college uh, that was at uh, Marienburg, uh, it, the home of the Teutonic Knights uh, on the Nagat River. And they would bring that, that person there and they would spend all of this time waiting for the person to come in the next year behind them and the one come in behind them, that they would, they would have them gathered at this school and that, that each of these, uh, these deputy Fuhrers would be put in charge of an entire nation state. 
They'd be put in charge of Brazil or Argentina uh, or the United States or Canada. That They were going to be put in charge working directly under Adolf Hitler. Uh, and so the, this whole uh, order of the castles, the Ordensbergen, what, what happened is that after the war was over, that Reinhard Galen actually set up a school at, at the first one of these at Krozenje, they out, out by Oberammergau in the Bavarian mountains. He set up this school and they began to recruit young men from all of the allied nations that had been organized against Germany and Japan uh, in Italy and uh, in Spain. And that uh, they, they recruited them in and they spent from 1948 all the way to 1960 training 1,200 men at that facility. And they were in every one of the major countries, US, Canada, France, England, and including the new state of Israel. They, they actually trained Israelis at this academy because the Israeli, the Israeli government had resolved that it was not going to be excluded from this new order that they were going to be considered to be Caucasian people and that they were going to be landed with their new state of Israel and they were no longer going to be among the nomadic, the nomadic uh, colored people of the world. And, uh, and so you had people like Michael Harari was trained there who was put in charge later by Golda Meir of this group called the Wrath of God which was the group of the, uh, of the Israeli Mossad that were assigned to track down and assassinate uh, the Black September uh, people who who uh, killed the uh, the Olympiads, the uh, Israeli Olympiads in 1972 in Munich. But the the, bo the bottom line is is that what you see happening here is right at the very end of the war, the the German high command realizes that it's not going to be able to win, and so what they do is they reach back out to the same fascist elements in the United States that were trying to stop the U.S. from coming into the war against them to begin with, and they start establishing alliances. And so what happens is that a lot of the people that were in the OSS, uh, that, uh, that were in charge of special intelligence and special operations uh, during the war, uh, they in fact were made up of people that were uh, the elite. The, the elite had been recruited into the OSS. Uh, guys like w William Donovan, uh, for example, who was the head of the OSS. Uh, you get a, you get a, a slight, a slight favor, a flavor of this. In fact, I found a, an interesting little tidbit here about Donovan. When you, you, he, see, he was the guy that was selected to head up the Office of Special Services. And the Office of Special Services are the guys that are reached out to to have these negotiations with Galen at the end of World War II. And what happens is they begin to set up a thing called the Rat Line where they're beginning to actually take these uh, elite remainder of the, of the governing core of the Nazis of the Third Reich and sneak them out of Germany and Europe and move them into Argentina and Paraguay and Uruguay. Uh, and, that, and that this is all being done in cooperation with Pope Pius XII who had signed the Concordat with Mussolini uh, in his fascist uh, cabinet people in the Vatican that uh, they, had, they were all involved in helping to do this. Yes, Sophia. Okay, a couple more questions. First of all, uh, okay, first of all, wasn't Pope Pius, though, didn't he also help save Jews in the Vatican? Because I've heard, I've heard varying things about him. I've heard both that he was a Nazi collaborator and that he was secretly fighting the Nazi war effort, but didn't want to make that too public for fear of getting himself killed. So I've heard both things, but, I, but I've, I've heard accounts where he was a good guy and accounts where he was a bad guy. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, no, that's, there's, um, there's, there's been a major effort on the part of the Vatican to paper over uh, the conduct of Pius XII uh, and his Secretary of State, Cardinal Vio, and others. Uh, but the, and, and it's, it's, it is true that there were elements of the Catholic Church, a lot of the missionaries, more, more than the Vatican themselves, that were involved in attempting to try to save Jewish people. Uh, but the, the, the fact of the matter is the hierarchy, the very top of the, of the Catholic Church under Pius XII uh, and his Secretary of State Cardinal Vio and others in the Vatican 
were, were affirmatively sympathetic uh, with the fascist cause, uh, just like they were sympathetic with the fascists in the United States. A lot of these extremely wealthy, powerful people in the United States were Catholics. Uh, take, for example, William Donovan that I was just talking to you about. That uh, you, you, get, you get just a little bit of the beginning of, of this. I'll give you an idea. William Donovan is the guy that was the head of the OSS that was cooperating with Galen at the end of the war. And, and, and you just get a little reading this. Uh, William, Don, William Donovan studied law at Columbia Law School from 1903 to 1908. So here comes another lawyer. Here comes uh, Bill Donovan. Uh, one of his professors, Harlan Stone, took a liking to him. Another protege of Stone was J. Edgar Hoover. As Attorney General, Stone uh, named Hoover to become the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So Hoover was at the law school at the time. So what they had is that Stone, Harlan Stone, took uh, two, of his, two of his favorite students, just let this be a lesson to you, uh, they took them, in fact, made one of them Attorney General of the United States, and had the other one selected to become, become the head of the FBI uh, out of his law school class. And in, uh, in Donovan, Donovan uh, uh, said another Columbia Law School professor liked Donovan as well, Jackson Reynolds, later became the president of the first national bank, and he backed Donovan to become the new head of the OSS. In 1910, Donovan met Eleanor Robeson, an actress who later married August Belmont, the American uh, heir to the Rothschild fortune. There was no possibility of their marriage because he was looking for a rich wife and she was looking for a rich, a rich husband. But they began a secret sexual relationship that lasted for many years. So he went and opened his law practice, uh, Donovan, and met Ruth Rumsey, an heiress to one of the richest families in America. Her father was Dexter Rumsey. Her uncle was Bronson, who owned 22 acres of the 43 acres of the city of Buffalo. In 1890, Dexter Rumsey was worth $10 million uh, in, in, 1908, in 1890 money. His wife was a member of the wealthy Hazard family of Rhode Island, who had owned 1,000 slaves and were at one time the largest slave owners in America. The Rumseys were master of the Genesee Valley Hunt at the Country Club, the most exclusive country club in the U.S. Dexter Rumsey died in 1906, leaving his daughter 12% uh, of his fortune. So Bill Donovan married her and ends up, it goes through all these connections. Uh, because of his connections, the Rockefeller Foundation selected Donovan to go to Europe in 1915 at the end of the war uh, and he established contact with the high command of the Germans at the end of World War I. This is the exact same time when, when uh, Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles, under Robert Lansing, are participating in the Versailles Treaty, setting up the reparations requirements. And Donovan has been sent over to Germany by the Rockefellers uh, to become a source of intelligence for him in connecting them to the, to the, uh, the leadership of the German government. Uh, and when World War, II, World War I breaks out, he ends up uh, enlisting in the, in the army uh, and, and after his, his tour of duty as an intelligence officer, and he's awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, and he became a very big celebrity. And after the war, J.P. Morgan, established the Foreign Commercial Corporation to float two billion dollars in bonds uh, to be sold in post-war Europe. In February of 1920, J.P. Morgan hired Donovan, a lawyer, to make a secret tour of Europe to obtain intelligence for his, his businesses. So you see what happens is the guy who becomes the head of the OSS in World War II is in fact been working for John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan. Uh, he's an attorney for them, and so he ends up being put in charge of the OSS, and so what he does is, uh, because of his positive relationship with the high officials in the German, in the German uh, government, he ends up establishing this, uh, this alliance with, uh, with uh, Galen, and, and it turns out that Alan Dulles is instrumental in getting the German government to, uh, to sign a surrender. So Alan Dulles, another lawyer for Brown Brothers Harriman and the lawyer at Sullivan and Cromwell, 
is working to get the Germans to be able to negotiate a peace treaty with the United States. And, uh, Don, and while Bill Donovan is in fact working with, with uh, uh, General, uh, General uh, what's it, Galen, to be able to sneak, put him in charge of intelligence in Europe after this, and to help sneak out the high command of Germany, to sneak them into Argentina and Uruguay and Paraguay and Brazil. Okay, and then they set up this special intelligence uh, school, this anti-communist special warfare training academy, which is being run by Otto Skorzeny, General, Major General Otto Skorzeny, a six foot five, uh, massive guy that was the, uh, with the, with the, the Heidelberg uh, 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 dueling scar on his face, I told you, in the six league boots, in the riding crop, and he was the commander of the uh, anti-communist special warfare training academy. He was the head of the SS, special forces for SS, which gives you some idea what he's like, right? Uh, and so this guy ends up being the trainer for these 1,200 guys. And these 1,200 men are trained from 1948 to 1960. And these 1,200 men spread out all across Western civilization. And they're high up in the intelligence communities, military intelligence communities of all of the major allies. And they have this kind of horizontal relationship with each other, that they've all been schooled at this particular place by Otto Skorzeny. And they have these, these uh, horizontal relationships with each other, which in fact are a stronger bond than their vertical relationships to their respective governments. And so what you have in the field is you have a whole group of people that are in at the level of majors functioning in the field of intelligence and covert operations. You have the generals up at the very top who are the moneyed 60 to 100 men who are sitting as clients meeting together in these interlocking directorates. And you have the colonels above those in the middle who are the lawyers. And the lawyers are in the field, you know, plying the business of these guys. Uh, and so, that, so what happens is that there's a continuation of this same kind of sympathy and indeed alliance among these fascists uh, that existed prior to the war, World War II, that was stopping the U.S. from coming into the war against Germany. They begin to realign themselves at the very end of World War II and they sneak out the major leadership and they put them down in South America and they hide other guys under new assumed names all through, all through Europe and they end up becoming mayors and, uh, and, and uh, governors and presidents and stuff of the different countries under different names, okay? And, and that uh, a lot of this was funded, I, I just mentioned it to you briefly one time, but a very important uh, piece of this is that, uh, is that at the very end of the war in September of 1945, uh, that this guy uh, Lansing, uh, or, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Lansdale, Edward Lansdale, who was in the OSS under Donovan. The OSS got disbanded in, in the summer of 1945 after the Germans surrendered. They disbanded the, the OSS, they distributed them out around, and Edward Lansdale became the G2, the head of military intelligence in the Philippines. And he, you remember this, now this is a very important event that took place, Lansing uh, along with this, along with this, uh, this uh, fellow by the name of uh, Santo Romano, uh, they torture, torture the driver of the Japanese prince who was a cousin to the emperor Hiroshima, Hiroshito, that, uh, Hirohito. Yeah, Hirohito, thank you. Anyway, he, he, they end up torturing, torturing the driver of the first cousin to the emperor, who was the prince who went around with General Yakushima, who was actually burying all this treasure that the, that the Japanese military had been raiding all throughout uh, Southeast Asia, uh, all through the 1930s. Uh, and they had collected billions and billions and billions of dollars in gold and silver and platinum and jewels, precious jewels, all throughout uh, Southeast Asia. And that when they realized, when the Japanese uh, Imperial Command realized that the, they were, the war was lost and that the United States was going to be eventually invading uh, the islands of Japan, uh, they, they secretly shipped out all of this treasure and they buried it in 176 different deep mine troves 
that they, that they built all throughout the Philippine Islands. And they would take prisoners of war uh, as slave labor and, and order them to dig these gigantic mines, these big deep, you know, 200, 300 foot deep mines. And then they would stack all this gold bullion and silver bullion and, 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 uh, and platinum, et cetera, in huge 50 gallon uh, barrels of precious diamonds and rubies and jewels. Uh, and they would bury them uh, in 176 of these different treasure troves. And then they would bury this, the slave labor with them and kill them all and bury them with the treasure so that no one would ever be able to know where this was. And they crafted a set of maps for these things and then they booby-trapped these mines uh, and, and buried them. And what happened is that uh, there, was, there was rumor around about this having been done in the intelligence circles. OSS knew about it. And so this guy, this guy Edward Lansdale, who was the G2 now in the Philippines in September of 1945, knew about this and so he got his hands on the driver uh, of, this, of this young uh, Japanese prince uh, who had accompanied all of the burials uh, of these sites and they tortured him. Uh, and they got him to acknowledge uh, where 12 of these were. Uh, and uh, and uh, Edward Lansdale and this guy Santo Romano, they put together a crew of people and they went to one of these sites and they dug it up and they found in just one of the 12 sites uh, 100 billion dollars worth of gold and platinum uh, and jewels. And it turns out that all 12 of the troves had 100 billion dollars in each one of them. And so they ended up having 1.2 trillion dollars uh, that they had discovered. And so Edward Lansdale then uh, goes to Singapore, I believe it was, where uh, General Douglas MacArthur was, who was the commander of the Western forces in the Pacific. He flies to Singapore and he goes to see General uh, MacArthur to tell him what they have found. And General MacArthur brings into his meeting uh, his G2, uh, the head of his military intelligence, uh, a, guy, a guy by the name of General Charles Willoughby, uh, who it turns out his real name is uh, Adolf Wiedenbach, who is a, a German fascist but who in fact had come to the United States before World War II like Theodore Shackley and in fact had been enlisted in the United States military and was a G2. And so he was the G2 for Douglas MacArthur. So Douglas MacArthur brings into this meeting uh, General Charles Willoughby and he sits there with Edward Lansdale. Well Lansdale tells him about having uncovered 1.2 trillion dollars in gold and platinum and silver and jewels. What they do is General MacArthur gives, assigns to them his, his DC-7 and flies them from Singapore back, to, back to, uh, the, to the Philippines and then back to Hawaii and then back to Washington State and then back to Omaha and into Washington, D.C. And they go in to have a meeting with President Truman now. This is, in, this is now in, in, uh, in September, October of 1945. And, uh, and, uh, and Roosevelt has been dead since April 12th of 1945. So Truman is now in office. So they go in to see Truman. And in order to get to meet with Truman, they had to talk with his chief of staff, uh, Clark Clifford, to be given permission to talk with him. So they go in and have this meeting. And as soon as the meeting starts and they reveal to uh, President Truman what they've got here, President Truman stops the meeting and he brings in uh, 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 Secretary of War Stimson, Henry Stimson, and Henry Stimson brings in his three deputy, deputy secretaries of war, one of whom is Robert Lovett, the other one is, uh, is uh, uh, Robert Anderson, both of whom are in fact senior partners in Brown Brothers Harriman, okay, and their attorneys. And that they come into the meeting along with, with uh, John J. McClure, who's the third deputy. And they come in, and the decision is made in that meeting that that $1.2 trillion is not going to be turned over uh, to the Philippine government. It's not going to be returned to the people from whom it had been stolen. And it's not going to be turned over to the American government. It's going to be put into a private trust fund uh, that is going to be supervised by the partners of Brown Brothers Harriman, okay? 
and that the, the Robert Lovett and, uh, and, uh, and Robert Anderson and John McClure, they end up administering this particular trove of $1.2 trillion and they ship it out of the Philippines and they put it into the International uh, Credit and Commerce Bank in Geneva, Switzerland, and they begin to issue gold certificates, which they use to finance the election of these secret fascists who are now having their names changed and they start getting them elected all throughout Europe to be able to reconstitute a bulwark against Bolshevism in Europe. <laughs> so this whole thing continues again. So you've got Brown Brothers Harriman again in the, in the driver's seat, now funded with $1.2 trillion in secret treasure, which they're using, issuing gold certificates, to actually finance the elections of fascists all throughout Europe. Okay, and so that this is the reality that we're dealing with here. And, and so what, what, what I did is I've run into these guys. I ran into these guys in their late 20th century manifestation uh, because Alan Dulles was still the director of the Central Intelligence Agency as, as late as 1962. Uh, you know, and so, so that what, what late, actually November of 1961. But so what I, I, when, I, when I came out and started discovering these things, uh, when I got out of law school, I started running into these people who were still operative at the time. Uh, and where I ran into them initially was in discovering that these were the people that had authorized the assassination of the president uh, in Dallas in November of 1962. Ed Lansdale was there photographs of Ed Lansdale uh, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the square. Uh, Charles Willoughby, uh, turns out Charles Willoughby, who was a member of the G2 of, of General MacArthur, when MacArthur had gotten into this confrontation in 1951 with Truman in Korea, which you probably have heard about, where, uh, where General MacArthur wanted to drop atomic bombs <coughs> Uh, all along the Yanzu, Yazoo River uh, in northern Korea to, to erect a wall of radiation to keep the Chinese from coming in to support the North Koreans when the United States was involved in an attempt to basically take over the, the, the peninsula of Korea to try to establish a military land base in Southeast Asia. And uh, the, the, the northern quote, northern Koreans uh, were being driven back by, uh, by the American forces and the Chinese came in uh, and, and were basically uh, pushing back the American troops uh, at the, uh, at the uh, reservoir, the big famous battle that took place there. The, the, but the bottom line is, Rose, or excuse me, uh, MacArthur wanted to drop atom bombs to keep them from advancing any farther. And Truman opposed that. Uh, and, and so MacArthur started speaking out publicly against him and started organizing behind uh, Truman's back to try to get senators and others to support his use of nuclear weapons against the Chinese. And, uh, and Truman didn't fire him. They, they all say, oh, he was fired. He wasn't fired, he was just relieved of his command and was assigned to some minor place. And uh, so what he did is he resigned uh, and, and, and let it be broadcast that he'd been fired, basically, to generate sympathy. And what happened is he was invited right away to fly back into the United States and to come to Dallas, Texas, uh, financed by H.L. Hunt, a major oil magnate, uh, and a guy by the name of William D. Pauley, who was a major sugar magnate uh, that was all clearly part of this kind of elite group that those are, those are people who are going to be part of this 60 people. Uh, you're going to have Charles Willoughby. You're going to have, uh, you're going to have uh, H.L. Hunt. Uh, you're going to have uh, William D. Pauley. These people are part of this core. And what they did is that when they, uh, when they came into Dallas in 1951, right away there was a huge ticker tape parade uh, sponsored and paid for by H.L. Hunt and William D. Pauley and they opened an office for General Douglas MacArthur for president. They were gonna to try to bring him in. And it's important to remember that General Douglas MacArthur is the guy that the, the 
people who tried to stage the military coup against Roosevelt back in 1934 were going to go to if in fact Schmedley Butler didn't, wouldn't agree to lead the, the fascist uh, push against, against Roosevelt. And so they, they, these guys are still at it. They're now in 1951 getting ready to try to run uh, General MacArthur for president uh, in the 1952 presidential election. Uh, and, they, and right away, Charles Willoughby establishes a, a, an organization uh, with H.L. Hunt's assistance and funding. They, they set up a thing called the Field, in, the, the field in Operations Intelligence. Field Operations Intelligence is a, a peculiar uh, organization with major secret private funding from H.L. Hunt and from, from, uh, uh, from uh, William Pauley. And they start functioning as, a, as a, a, a private civilian intelligence operation working with the Central Intelligence Agency uh, and with the United States military intelligence. Uh, and this is just at the same time when Alan Dulles is being brought in to be the new director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay? So the, the, this, it's a, a field operations intelligence, it's called. Okay? And at the same time, now this is all with, with, with high-level military intelligence guys in military intelligence, Central Intelligence Agency operatives, etc., that are all being secretly funded and, and fielded uh, by this organization, okay, that Willoughby is basically set up. Uh, and he at the same time, actually the next year, 1952, he sets up another private operation that's called uh, the Foreign Intelligence Digest. Foreign Intelligence Digest is a, like a monthly newsletter uh, that is prepared. <coughs> he, hires <coughs> he hires lots and lots of former low-level military intelligence officers uh, from World War II that are naval, uh, in, uh, naval intelligence officers, uh, U.S. Army intelligence officers, uh, Army CID people, criminal intelligence investigation people. They start hiring a whole lot of kind of low-level uh, civilians now that are out of the Army that have military intelligence backgrounds. And he puts them in the field. <clears throat> and they begin spying on American citizens everywhere. They start going to ACLU meetings. They go to NAACP meetings. They go to uh, all, every kind of uh, liberal organization. And they start spying on them uh, in filing reports. And they put them out in these newsletters. Uh, which are then subscribed to by private corporations. Private corporations are the only ones that get this newsletter and they start getting all the information about these subversive organizations that are around the United States. And, the, the, uh, and one of the corporations that gets this monthly newsletter is called the World Commerce Corporation. The World Commerce Corporation's uh, chief counsel and chief of security is William Donovan fellow that I'd mentioned to you. Uh, and they set up a thing called the International Commerce Corporation. The International Commerce Corporation, uh, the chief funder of which is, uh, is William D. Pauley. Now this fellow William D. Pauley is, a, is an interesting character. Uh, William D. Pauley is born in Cuba. Uh, he was the owner of a large uh, sugar plantations down in Cuba uh, under Batista. Uh, he in fact owned the major public transportation systems, uh, all of the rail, the rail lines, and the trolley system in Havana. Uh, and when when uh, Batista took over, uh, he was he immediately started organizing people to try to overthrow Castro. Okay, but he had been in hand in glove with Batista, this fascist dictator in in Cuba that was one of the people that had been installed by the United States after they had taken over Cuba as early as 1898, that they kept a whole series of dictators in power there. And the latest of them was Batista, uh, Fagilio Batista. And Batista had, after World War II, at the end of World War II, another very important thing that, that you need to know. I, I, it's, I, I don't apologize for this download. Uh, but I know, I know how, how challenging it is, uh, the details of it. That's why we record this for you, so that you can go back and look at these things. But you, I, I just want to make sure, I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you this, okay? So that it gives you the ability to, to grasp and know something that, that almost none of the other members of your generation know about. 
because they will not be told this in any of the other schools where they go. They won't, okay? But in, in this particular case, uh, it becomes important because what happened at the end of World War II, just before, in preparation for D-Day, June 6th of 1944, that they were gonna have the landings at Normandy. Uh, in preparation for that, uh, Tom Dewey, who was the governor of New York at the time and was going to be the likely prospect for the Republican Party to run against Truman, okay? That, uh, that, that, but because they, they figured that, that Roosevelt wasn't going to run for another term. Uh, and this was now in 1943 before he had died. But what happened is in 1943, Governor Tom Dewey sends his representative a uh, special assistant district attorney in New York by the name of Murray Gerfine, uh, sends him to uh, Comstock Prison in Great Meadows, New York, the big maximum security prison for, for white collar crime uh, in New York. And in that prison were a lot of the major organized crime figures that had been arrested uh, by Tom Dewey when he was the DA, the kind of crusading DA for Manhattan. Uh, and he had put a number of them away. And one of the guys he put away was Lucky Luciano, uh, for white slavery, for running prostitution and income tax evasion. And Lucky Luciano was there at Comstock Prison at Great Meadows, and, and Tom Dewey sends in to meet with him, uh, Murray Gerfine, and they, they cut a deal whereby uh, Lucky Luciano is going to be given a pardon by the governor, who had been the guy who prosecuted him, is going to give him a pardon, in exchange for which Lucky Luciano is going to agree to go back to Sicily, and he's going to organize uh, members of the mafia uh, the Italian Mafia to serve as scouts for the United States landing forces when they come in because they're going to come in originally at Salerno uh, and, uh, in, in Sicily. Uh, and so what happens is that they release him uh, and in fact uh, the, the, the Fifth Army when it comes up from North Africa and invades uh, at, uh, at Salerno and Anzio are all greeted by these scouts that are all Mafia people. And they had these big yellow bandanas that are the sign of the, of the Sicilian Mafia uh, flying on the antennas of their cars. And they, they meet them there. When they fight their way off the beaches, these scouts come in and they start assisting them in going, on, going into Italy and, and going through the mountains and stuff and being ready to meet them up in Normandy when they come in. And so that there's an alliance established right away by the intelligence community uh, with the Mafia. And one of the other things that they got uh, Lucky Luciano to agree to do as a condition for his being released uh, and sent back to Sicily, they, he agreed to help them get the Mafia to help infiltrate the Longshoremen's Union uh, along the eastern and western coasts and the, the uh, Teamsters Unions to keep any communists from coming into the ports in the, the labor unions that, that handle the shipping uh, and the trucking so that the communists will not be able to disrupt the war effort, uh, okay? So that that's, that's what they get them to do. But there's a third thing that they get them to agree to do, and that is they get the mafia to agree to transport opium out of the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia at the end of World War II and to transport it and smuggle it into Corsica, into the Fran French, where it's transformed into heroin, and then to transport that, to smuggle that into Cuba. And that there's a major base set up in Cuba uh, called the Sea Supply Corporation, SEA, Southeast Asia Supply Corporation, uh, run by a fellow by the name of Paul Helliwell, another attorney who is an attorney for the Central Intelligence Agency uh, and, a, and a, a, a public accountant as well as a lawyer. Uh, and, and he ends up running the Sea Supply Corporation which handles the, the heroin coming into, into Cuba. They handle it and they, they, they sell it through the mafia into the United States. And monies, a portion of the profits from that are paid over to the Sea Supply Corporation which they use to buy military supplies which are being flown uh, out of the United States in, in, into, into Europe and being flown over the hump into uh, China to the nationalist Chinese, to Chiang Kai-shek and the, and the Kuomintang, who are the ones that the West has chosen 
to oppose the rise of communism, they call it, in China under Mao Zedong. And so that what they're doing is they've set up a secret covert supply operation being funded by the sale of heroin in the United States in alliance with, this, with the, uh, the mafia and the new CIA that has been set up. Because Paul Helliwell is a full-time, full employee with retirement benefits uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency. And he is brokering the sale of the heroin and purchasing the weapons which are being flown over the hump covertly into, into uh, the nationalist Chinese. So this is, this is the operation that is being set up uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, and the, the, the entire World War II generation now uh, of, of, of new members of this elite group are coming online. Because these, these old 19th century and early 20th century robber barons are now getting very long in the tooth. And so that there's a whole new generation of their sons coming on board. So that that's, that's who we have to deal with here. And, the, and so this young fellow, this guy Theodore Shackley, the, the German-American guy who was the translator for Reinhard Galen, starts to rise into higher and higher positions of power because of his relationship with this intelligence operation going on. And he's, he's, he has graduated from the very first class of the Central Intelligence Agency at the Fish Farm in, in 1948. Uh, and he is assigned to become the deputy to Reinhard Galen over in Berlin. Uh, and he is sent to the school, the Anti-Communist Special Warfare Training Academy, and graduates in the first graduating class of that group under Otto Skorzeny. And he stays in Berlin at a place called the Berlin Operating Base. They call it Bob. It's a, it's a very well-known place inside clandestine uh, intelligence circles. And uh, Bill Harvey and uh, a whole bunch of guys uh, that were that were there. Frank uh, Frank uh, 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 Sergis was there. Uh, Bill Harvey, uh, David Sanchez Morales, David Atlee Phillips. A lot of these guys were there at the end of World War II. And John McClone McClone uh, was one of the guys. Remember, uh, who is one of the three guys who's the trustees for the Anderson Trust, the 1.2 trillion dollars. That he is in fact designated to be the new uh, commanding uh, commander of uh, the American occupation forces in Germany, in West Germany. So you've got John J. McCloy, uh, you've got uh, Shackley, you've got David uh, Sanchez Morales, you've got David Atlee Phillips, you've got Frank Sturgis, Bill Harvey. All of these guys that were at the Berlin operating base are involved in killing the president in 1963. These are the same guys, and they all get transferred down into Miami when Theodore Shackley is brought in to be the new station chief in, in Miami. Okay, So he's brought out of Berlin after spending years sitting right under this fascist Nazi uh, guy, uh, Galen, in the middle of his organization. They've got this whole group of fascists that are there in the Berlin operating base of the Central Intelligence Agency under Bill Harvey and Henry Hexter. You know, and these guys are all transferred with Shackley down into Miami. And it becomes the largest CIA base anywhere in the world outside of Langley. And this operation is dedicated to trying to overthrow Fidel Castro. Because when, when Castro rose to power in, in Cuba in, uh, uh, on New Year's Eve of 1959, uh, January 1st of 1959, that right away it disrupts the entire flow of heroin coming into the United States, which is being used by the, the CIA to covertly fund the Comintang. Uh, and it ousts from power one of the major mafia bases. The, the mafia has the casinos, the gambling casinos, and the houses of prostitution uh, uh, down, down in, in, in Havana. Uh, and they were using it as a base of funding to help build up Las Vegas to build the whole city of Las Vegas out in the desert, to, to set up a main gambling and prostitution center here in the country. But I thought Las Vegas got built because of the nuclear tests. No, no, nope, not true. Uh, Las, Vegas, Las Vegas was built by the, by the mob. 
to actually set up a place for their casinos and stuff, to be able to service California, to have the people come from California, the wealthy people from California, to, to participate in a place like that. So there's, there's about, there's a, uh, a half a dozen uh, people that one could track in, uh, through the tracking of any one of these people, you could find out what's going on uh, at the level of the colonels and the majors. What you don't get told, however, is what the generals are doing. Well, the, these, the general officers are the ones that sit together uh, at that time in, in Brown Brothers Harriman uh, and in the, uh, the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell basically pulling the strings on this operation in that there's this peculiar relationship that exists on the part of the mafia with the colonels, not with the generals, but with the colonels. These guys like, uh, like William Pauley uh, and Bill Harvey and Theodore Shackley and these other people, these are field operatives uh, that we're dealing with here. But the, but the, uh, the literal fascists who are sitting on, uh, on the boards of directors and sitting in as clients of Brown Brothers Harriman and uh, as legal part legal uh, clients of, of Sullivan and Cromwell, these guys are not involved in that stuff. They're just running these major corporations, making tons of money and calling the shots on what, what happens. Uh, and the operations, the day-to-day -day operations, are left under the command of the colonels. Uh, these guys like Shackley and Ed Lansdale and William Pauley uh, and these others. These are the ones that are, and, and, and guys like, uh, like, uh, uh, the, like the fellow in, in Cuba that's running, that's running these operations. These are lawyers that are all running the operations for these people who are clients. Because most of these extremely wealthy individuals are now in position of having inherited the money. And so they're, they're not really people that are running the corporations, they're just sitting as the board of directors of these, uh, these things. And in fact, they're not lawyers. Uh, their lawyers are functioning as the, as the lieutenants, or excuse me, as the, as the colonels and the majors. And so one can go through a lot of these individuals and, uh, and talk with you about who they are uh, and, uh, and give you the details of them. And uh, I just want to give you the names of some of them. There's one I mentioned to you who sits in the high circle is Henry Luce. There's another fellow by the name of C.D. Jackson uh, who is there. C.D. Jackson, very wealthy uh, a fellow who, who was the, uh, the chief of propaganda for the Defense Department during World War II. Uh, and he, he ended up being, he's, he's brought on by Henry Luce to be the, the publisher uh, of Life Magazine. Uh, the former head of propaganda in the Defense Department is made the head of Life Magazine working for Henry Luce, who has already written the editorial praising the fascists. Uh, and, and, and Paul Helliwell is the fellow that I mentioned that's in Cuba. Robert Lovett, I've mentioned to you, is one of the three people that are, is administering uh, the Anderson Trust. Uh, the Anderson Trust that I've talked to you about is the $1.2 trillion. Uh, it's also known as the Black Eagle Trust. Uh, it's uh, nicknamed. Uh, but Robert Lovett is, uh, is a, a, a senior partner in Brown Brothers Harriman and a lawyer. Uh, and John J. McCloy, who is another one of the three people that's administering that fund, uh, who is also a lawyer. Robert Anderson, that I've, that I've told you about. All of these guys are functioning at this, at this level as the colonels that I'm talking about. Then there are these majors that are down below them, and, and these are fascists. These are fascists like Bill Harvey, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, other people that are day-to-day are -day field operations guys who all share the fascist ideology and they all know, they all know that the President of the United States isn't really in charge. They know that the people in Congress aren't really in charge. The chairman of the different committees aren't really in charge. They know that the guys upstairs are in charge. And they know that the colonels are the ones that are, are communicating the commands to them. But the majors that are in the field uh, are a lot of these people who just share their fascist ideology who rise to power inside the government circles, such as uh, Major General Curtis LeMay that I mentioned to you, who is the chief of staff of the, of the, uh, the, of the Air Force. That he's not a guy that comes from a multi-million dollar family. Uh, he's, he didn't go to the Ivy League schools. He's not a lawyer. 
He's a, he's a crude, no-neck, cigar-chewing tough guy, you know, the, is, a, is the chief of staff of the Air Force. And, uh, and uh, the other guys, other guys we're dealing with uh, is, uh, is Lyman Lemonser. Lyman Lemonser is the chief of staff of the United States Army. He's, in fact, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. But he also is a fascist. He also was involved in supporting the distribution of, of uh, Birch Society, John Birch Society materials to be distributed out around to the military people on the bases. Uh, and that they were, they were organizing fascist groups and stuff inside the military. Uh, and Kennedy ordered that to be stopped. Uh, in, in fact, in, in Lemitzer is the one that brought to Kennedy in a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff the proposal for setting up Operation Northwoods to actually, as I've mentioned to you, to actually take Cuban refugees that had fled from Havana when, when Castro took over, have fled up to Havana, from Havana up to Tampa and up to Miami, dress them all up in Cuban uniforms and have them attack Guantanamo and kill American sailors and blow up American ships and then have them blow up shopping malls in Miami focusing on the Miami refugees to kill them in the, in the shopping malls uh, so that they could blame it on Cuba so they could invade Cuba. Okay? I mean, this is, this is General Lemonser uh, in Admiral Harley, Harley Burke, or Arley Burke, rather. Uh, these, are, these are people that have risen into positions of power who are, in fact, fascists, just like Bill Harvey uh, in, in J. Edgar Hoover, uh, head of the FBI. And uh, uh, Bill Harvey is, uh, is in charge of the, the Special Assassinations uh, Department uh, of the CIA under Alan Dulles. You know, and uh, so, so and, and Bill Harvey is a, another long story. But what I'm saying is that you can, you can, find, you can find who these people are at any given time. And, uh, and what I want to do after the break is I want to direct our attention to who these people are now and where you find them and how you recognize them because I want to spend the time next Tuesday and Thursday I want to spend on directing our attention to what can we possibly do about this you know uh, given our Constitution and the power that we have the rights that we have under the Constitution what can we do about this I want to direct our attention to that and I also want to right before the break I want to tell you I've got all your papers here but I I'm, I'm in the process. I want, to, I want to make sure I read every single one of them thoroughly because I have a tendency to uh, increase the grades a bit uh, when, when I see them. Uh, uh, and, and because, because I know of your participation in class, some of you, uh, and to, to add points to, to, your, to your grade, et cetera. And so I understand certain sometimes the things that you're trying to say in the paper that, that might not otherwise be clear. Uh, and so that I could either give you all the papers back now, but they probably uh, you're probably going to get your grade increased a little bit because I'm going to be taking them with me. I've got to drive for eight straight hours when we get done here tonight uh, down uh, to Southern California. I've got six major presentations I've got to make uh, on, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, in Monday morning, uh, and then turn around and drive back to be here Tuesday. So I'll bring the papers with me. Uh, and that uh, I, if, if anybody insists upon having their paper back now, I can give it to you. Did I, br I think I brought them. Uh, or maybe I le actually left them on my desk. <laughs> Too bad you don't get them. Uh, so, so you're all going to have to suffer probably having a couple points added to your grade. Uh, but anyway, so I'll, but I'll bring those to you Tuesday, okay? And uh, let's, let's take a break now for 10 minutes. And I want to turn our attention to trying to figure out uh, who these guys are now so that we can focus next week on what to do about them, okay? All right. <laughs>